Sure, ghosts and goblins are scary. But in some ways, there's nothing scarier than retirement. But don't worry, I'm here to help you face your fears. I'm David Scranton, and you're watching The Income Generation. Thanks for clicking on today's video. You know, it's that spooky time of year again, right? But when it comes to true scares, Halloween cannot compete with retirement. The transition to retirement is one of the biggest changes you'll ever make in life. And for many, it's full of unknowns. However, as with anything scary, the best way to conquer your fears is to face them. And I'll tell you how on today's show, scary facts about retirement. We'll share some scary facts about saving, inflation, healthcare, longevity, social security, and more. And most importantly, we'll show you how investing for income can help you eliminate a good number of these scary unknowns and actually enter retirement with enthusiasm and peace of mind instead of fear. So I'd like to start with some scary statistics about the very foundation of retirement, and that's your savings. The good news is over half of Americans say they are actively saving for retirement. The bad news is that it's just over half. That's 58% according to one recent study. So of course that means that 42% of people aren't saving at all. Additionally, of those who are saving, 48% say they have less than $10,000 squirreled away. Among baby boomers, more than half say they expect that all or most of their retirement income will come from Social Security. And that is a scary notion when you consider that the average Social Security benefit this year was just $1,503 a month. That amounts to $18,036 a year, which is only about $5,000 over the federal poverty level. Also, you really can't count on your benefits keeping pace with inflation. The program's annual cost of living adjustment, or COLA, is typically low. And it's often negated by increase in premiums for Medicare Part B. Uh, the COLA was just 1.3% this past year, far below the estimated annual healthcare inflation rate of nearly 5%. And speaking of healthcare inflation, please consider these scary facts. Since 1948, the price of medical care has grown at an average annual rate of 5.3%, compared to the 3.5% for general inflation. So when you get close to 6% a year, which means health care and medical costs are essentially doubling approximately every 12 years. And that includes everything from prescription drugs to long-term care to full-time home health care. Additionally, according to the Employee Benefit Research Institute, a 65-year-old man with median prescription drug expenses, not super high, just median, throughout retirement, would need about $73,000 saved just to have a 50% chance of covering Medicare premiums and other out-of-pocket expenses. A woman in the same boat, who's expected to live a little bit longer, right? Females live longer than men, as a general rule, would need about $95,000. Now, what about long-term care? That's a whole different story, right? Well, again, if the costs are doubling about every 12 years, please consider this. If you're in your 60s today and you're budgeting as much as maybe $200,000 a year for full-time in-home care, right? Because nobody retires and wants to move into a convalescent home. By time you need that full-time in-home care, you might be in your late 80s or even 90s, and the expense could be four times as high. That's $800,000. And again, those, yes, are some scary figures that help explain why so many people approach retirement with fear. But you know, there are other reasons. About 80% of Americans don't understand retirement planning, and this is according to a 2020 Retirement Income Literacy Survey. And yes, this statistic is frightening, but it's also understandable. Why? Because when you consider that most Americans, over 60%, report that they're learning about retirement planning mostly by word of mouth, friends and coworkers. So both of these statistics 
I believe, explain uh, this more. More Americans today are working past retirement age out of financial necessity. And according to AARP, more than 20% of adults over the age of 65 are either working or looking for work. And most say it's not because they want to, it's because financially they have to. And this number has doubled since 1995. So yes, there are legitimate reasons to be scared by this prospect of retirement. But here's the good news. There's no reason to be a prisoner of your fear. You can and should confront it and start working today to enjoy a happy, successful retirement instead of a scary, stressful one. In my experience, the key for most lies in shifting your financial focus from portfolio growth to retirement income, ideally in the 10 years or so leading up to retirement. To begin with, the income model, as we often call it on the show, helps you understand why the size of your nest egg isn't the be-all and end-all of a successful retirement. In fact, many people put too much emphasis on their lump sum and not enough emphasis on the amount of income, interest, or dividends that that lump sum can generate. Also, because the income approach can be more strategic than investing for growth, which does involve some amount of luck and cooperation by the financial markets, it must include provisions to address and tackle all these frightening issues that we've discussed today. Longevity, inflation, healthcare inflation, the desire to maximize social security, satisfy your RMDs, create an estate plan, and most importantly, to generate enough reliable income so you never have to go back to work if you don't want to. And ultimately, investing for income helps you see retirement as something to look forward to and to enjoy, not to fear, as it should be. Now it's time to introduce today's guests. First of all, Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services. As usual, Jeff, it's always great to talk with you. Great to see you, Dave. Glad to be here. And today's special guest, Harry Dent. Harry's the editor of Economy and Markets, which is a newsletter, and it's available for free at harrydent.com. Harry, great to have you with us again, as usual. Yeah, nice to be back, David. Harry, just to keep continuing our conversations, ongoing saga, the markets, it's a spooky time calendar-wise, but the markets certainly are, are, are not acting spooky. With earnings up over 27% year over year and projected 2022 stock earnings to be 9.3% over this year, give us your best bull or bear thesis going forward. Tell us what you think. Well, you know, this, uh, you talk about spooky markets. The spookiest markets are ones that go up super fast and vertical. So we had that 95 to 2000 for five years on almost vertical movement with almost no corrections. And we had it in 87 for three years, you know, from 84 to 87 straight up. And those things are always followed by big crashes because markets just cannot sustain bull moves like that. And even if there's some good things happening, good things don't sustain for that long either. So I my my problem with this, it's already pretty clear from every forecast I looked at. Yeah, we had a big rebound because of massive, I mean, trillions of dollars of stimulus, the greatest one and a half year surge in stimulus ever, counting fiscal and monetary, way bigger than anything before. And now, just a year and a half into the recovery, the economy's rolling over. GDP forecast keep getting revised down. The Federal Reserve, the Atlanta Federal Reserve just put out their forecast is GDP is quickly moving down to 1.2%. So if you stimulate this much and, and, and you only get a short move and the economy starts to weaken again, it shows that the economy's weak under underneath. So, so the worst thing can happen be uh, stocks bubbling up like there's no tomorrow because they've been doing it so long and the economy being very clear that this means you can have a straight down market in the next year. So my forecast for 2022, straight down, maybe the biggest one year crash we've seen in our lifetime, more than 87, more than 2000, you know, the first of that last big tech crash. Sure. So Harry, I guess my question then is what do you, you know, what triggers it? Because just a, a revised lower GDP estimate doesn't seem to be doing anything. The market participants seem to have blindfolds on. 
So usually there's that one trigger that starts to spook the markets and then starts that downward slide that then just snowballs. So what's your best guess as to maybe the, the top two possibilities for the things that spook the markets to start the slide? Well, you know, a part of it, I think they, they just get, you got to remember most corrections get started by the smart money. These are the people that love that the, they make money off the dumb money, which is most right. investors. OK, so they like to steer a market up. And when they think everybody they look at what everybody's done, when they think that everybody's piled into this. And I'm telling you, everybody is piled into this. I mean, you know, consumer sentiment, investment sentiment, everything's at the top, top, top. Whereas, again, the economy is already showing clear signs of weakening. Doesn't matter. So they're all in when these guys see this. They just start shorting it aggressively, and that's all it takes. Now, the thing is, when you're in a bubble like this, and this is why this is so important, it doesn't necessarily take a big thing. What happened when the Japan bubble burst in late 89? I, I used to ask people, what went wrong in Japan in late 89 that caused a 62% crash to come in the next few years? And the answer was, there was nothing. They just had a bubble so stretched that it finally Ooh. started to weaken, and then it builds momentum on it. And, and so I don't think it takes – some big news event, all I can tell you is the first crash, when a bubble finally has its first crash, it is 40 to 50% in two to three months. And my model is saying this one's going to be even worse, 53 to 56% in two and a half months is what we're likely yeah. to see. So all it takes yes. is this to weaken enough. And then yeah. and then the traders just say, oh, this is over. And then and it just goes. So it's not going to take, I don't think it's going to take a big trigger. Harry, listen, we know the Fed has overstimulated the markets. I mean, the economy, seven trillion of stimulus from last year is craziness. They're left with really bad choices going forward as the new addiction is stimulus for the economy to grow. But hypothetically, let's have some fun. Harry, if you were Jerome Powell, what would you do right now at the Fed? Well, see, so, so here's the problem. They're already trapped. When you stimulate an economy this long, you're getting an economy that should have shaken out, worked off a lot of bad. There's 22% zombie companies, technically de bankrupt, but they, they don't have to default when there's easy money and low interest rates and no recession. And, and, uh, and debt levels that, that are now a lot higher than they were already at the highest in history back at the 2007 top when that recession came in. When, when you just keep stimulating, then it takes exponentially more stimulus to keep a dead economy going. So if they just flatten here, whatever they do here, just taper. This thing is not going to be able to support itself. And the stocks are going to start going down. The economy start weakening. And they'll have to goose it up again. The problem is they've dug their own grave here. I think this thing is going to crash either, either after one more run into year end or, or, or in, in, in the first quarter, or it may just keep crashing here. But once it gets momentum, they're not going to be able to control it. And the way it happens, real simple, that first crash, 40 to 50%, you get a rebound when they do finally have a chance to react and do something stimulative again, but with a lot less credibility time. And then you get a two year plus grind down in stocks. Every major bubble burst has had that first dramatic crash, sharp rebound, and then a grinding downturn when people realize no they're so harry harry i'll take that answer is nobody wants to be jerome powell right now nobody wants that job because <laughs> if i was him i'd fake a heart attack and, and, and go disappear somewhere <laughs> okay well i'm sorry i asked you what you would do then okay so so okay so you think it's a quick 50 percent drop uh, next year and then a slow grind down after that so uh, at least a slow grind down is more manageable. People can pick sectors and, and try to get the right sectors that might have a better shot of doing well. But that precipitous drop is the scary part. But still, how far down do you see it going ultimately before all this shakes out maybe two or three years down the road? Well, I, I, I okay. First target, that first crash is pretty darn clear. The support in 2008 at best, about 2192 in my model, say 2100. So 20, actually 2000. So 2000 to 2200 is a good place for that first crash to happen. And that's right in that 50% crash range. Yep. And then you, you get a bounce just from it being oversold. I think what's going to happen here, which is going to be a bit unique, after this much stimulus for this long, and after they went 4.7 trillion versus in, in a year and a half versus 3.6 over nine years before that, this much stimulus and it fails, they, they, the, 
the Fed is going to lose credibility here. People are going to realize what's obvious to me, anybody with common sense, you can't run an economy on, on printing money out of thin air forever and expect, I mean, if there's just a short term crisis, then it should just take a year like, like, you know, in 2009, a year of printing a trillion dollars. By the way, I would have approved that level of stimulus. Just get the economy so it doesn't have to just default unnecessarily and just melt down for no good reason. But you do need to restructure debt if you're going to go forward. They never did that. So so the next downturn should take us down. My target is of down about 80 to 85 percent, down to about 600 to 1,000 on the S&P. So first target, 2,000, 2,200, bounce up maybe back toward back towards, you know, 2,800, something like that. And then you see that grind down to 600 to 1,000. And that should be over by late 2023, be my best guess. Wow, Harry. Well, uh, that gets us down to the lows in the middle of the financial crisis. I think we were 600 and something on the S&P. So, yeah. well, I, you know. Go you back know, to 2009 lows. <laughs> I know, I know. So all I can tell you is, you know, those, that is, those are some spooky Halloween facts, and uh, I know you're not doing it just because it's Halloween. And I think you're on to something in some ways. I hope you're wrong for the greater good, but I can't say that you are. But I look forward to having you back after the first of the year, and let's see how it's going. Harry, Jeff, thank you both for being back with us. Thanks for watching today's video, Scary Facts About Retirement. If you enjoyed this video, click the thumbs up button and give us a like. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for new content each and every week.